Hey guys, Patrick Coker out here once again, talking to folks about the Ten Commandments, doing some serious investigations. Let's talk about coveting. Okay. Have you ever coveted? Yes. What? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. <laughs> um, so what are your thoughts? Why is it wrong to want what someone else has? Because we weren't given it. I mean, God didn't choose for it to be ours, so why should we decide it's not in our plan? You know what it means to covet? Covet just means wanting what someone else has. Do you feel like that's wrong? I don't think it's wrong. I think it's honestly like pretty like involuntary to like want what someone else wants. Like envy is a really regular feeling to have. I think it's how you act like with it. Yeah. Because a lot of people when they feel envious, they turn it into like tearing down others because of their envy. But I don't think it's bad to have envy. I think it's bad if you react in a bad way. Okay, there's one called covet. And so basically that means wanting what someone else has. Uh, have you ever had that feeling before? Oh yeah, definitely. Like rich people, you see it all over social media. Like I would love to have that lifestyle, but it's not anything that I could probably have in this life from being like realistic. Let's talk Instagram and um, the TikToks yeah. and the Facebooks uh -huh. and the Twitters. Okay, let's talk about social media. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like people putting these images out there make it hard for you to be content with what you have and not want what others have? Yes, yeah, because it's very easy to be like, I have this, I'm happy with it. But then when I see someone else having it, it's easy to say, well, if I had it, I would be happier. You know, my grandmother always said comparison is the thief of joy. And I think that that is very much true. You see the best of what people put out there. And when you're looking at somebody's seemingly perfect life while your child is in the middle of having a tantrum in the living room floor, you can certainly let that bring you down as a parent. I do feel that social media has that effect on people because you know, like even the way I dress, you know, I'm like, I look at social media and I see that and I'm like, wow, I want to be like that or I need to, I want to look cool like that or I, I want to be able to dress that certain way or feel this certain way. I, I think it's negative. I really don't like how that social media affects it, but it does without, you know, without you really knowing. Mm -mm. Well, good morning. How are we? Good. Yeah, good. I tell you what, that young woman speaking about uh, her kids and seeing the Picture Perfect family online, she spoke directly to my soul just now. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, it is good to be with you guys this morning. Uh, if you're a guest, my name is Michael Bailey. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here, and it's a joy, as always, to get to be with you guys as we open up God's Word together. Uh, believe it or not, we are in the final week of our fall series that we entitled For Our Good Always. We made it all the way through. Today, we are going to be covering the last, the final, the 10th commandment uh, of, the, uh, of the big, God's big list. Uh, it feels like, honestly, in my opinion, that this is probably kind of like the right or appropriate time to, before we get too far into things, to just do a little bit of recap uh, of everywhere that we've been up to this point, to just remind us of the threads that we have been sort of like weaving through this entire series. Uh, and so I just want to kind of set up the big picture for us one last time before we get down into the this final command. Um, so by way of reminder, you know, the Ten Commandments, they were given to God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, after God had rescued them uh, out of slavery in Egypt. In a display of his covenant love and grace for his people, he delivered them from a life of futility and oppression to bring them into what the scriptures call the promised land, a place where God intended to bless his people and to give them the potential for a full and abundant life, a place where they could flourish as he originally intended for humankind to flourish. And the book of Deuteronomy, where we've been looking at all of these commands, is Moses' last words or his final sermon, so to speak, to the people of Israel before they enter into this promised land. And, and in it, what Moses is trying to do is he's trying to remind the people of just how good and gracious God truly is, to remind them of all that he's done for them and everything they have seen him do before them and how good he has been to them and that how ultimately he is for their good. And so everything that he commands of them is not to take anything away from them. It's not to ruin their lives or spoil their fun or anything like that, but it is ultimately for their flourishing, for their blessing, and for their good always. And this is basically what we have been trying to see through this entire series. It's to help us see that these things that God instructs of us, they are for our good. That God's commands and his desires, his plans, his will, his, uh, his design for human life is for our good. To help us see that God is loving and gracious and good. 
to, to, to likewise see that he is for our good in everything he says and desires and commands in the hopes that we would see that his way is actually the best way. Uh, and so with all of that in mind, I think what we're going to find today is that this last and final command is a really fitting conclusion to this entire series. Uh, in fact, I think this 10th command, it actually presses us further back into these truths that we've been seeing, that we've seen weaved throughout God's big list in ways that I honestly think that our community specifically really needs to hear. And so with all of that in mind, we're just going to jump right in to this last command. This is commandment number 10. We're going to pick up in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 21. This is what it says. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the 10th commandment. Now, obviously there's a bit to unpack here because obviously there is a little bit of historical and cultural distance between who this is being written to and the things that they might desire and us. But to put, put it simply, the 10th command is you shall not covet. Now, honestly, that word covet is not a word that we use all that much today, I know, uh, but it's a word that is very closely related to the idea of desire. It most literally means to yearn to possess to want something that you do not have. In the New Testament, the word for covet is oftentimes translated as lust. It's this insatiable desire for something that is not yours. I think the Christian writer Melissa Kruger actually has a really great definition of it. This is what she says. She says that covetousness is the inordinate or culpable desire to possess, often that which belongs to another. And I love that, inordinate desire, disproportionately large, excessive, obsessive, fixated, is to look at something your neighbor has. In the language of this text, their wife, their house, their land, their servants, or their ox or, do ox or donkey, and say, I must have that. I, I have to have it. If only I'd have that, then I would have everything that I need to be okay, to be happy to be satisfied, to have joy and peace or fill in the blank in life. And this is something that is actually rather unique about how this command is worded as opposed to the rest of the commands in the Ten Commandments. By that, I mean that most of the other commands are very action-oriented, right? Uh, they're very action-oriented. Uh, by that, I mean that most, uh, you, you see it in things like honor your parents, uh, keep the Sabbath, do not murder, do not bear false witness, do not steal. They often deal metaphorically with what we do with our hands, right? The things that we do. But this command deals with something else. This command deals with our minds and our hearts, the things we want, the things we feel, what we wish for, what we hope for, what we desire. Now, desire when it's directed towards the right things in the right ways is a good thing. I feel like this is something we know. So for example, a desire for your spouse to know them, to love them is a good thing that God wants of us. A desire for kids and to have a family that flourishes and thrives is a good desire, one that God built into this whole human project from the get-go. It's a beautiful thing. A desire to work hard, to be good at your job, to have a fruitful career and provide for others is a good thing. God has even made you for it. To want to cultivate the earth is reflective of God's desires for the world as well. The problem, according to the 10th commandment, is that our desires at times can go off the rails. The problem this is addressing is that at times, our desires can actually get out of whack. They, they can become out of order or excessive, so to speak. I love how the NIV actually phrases this first. It says, do not set your desire on. And I love the implications of that, that our desires can be set on things, that we have some agency here. We can set our desires on things. We can place them on the wrong things, or we can place them in the wrong ways that are out of line with what God has for his people. So we can want things that aren't good, but we can also want good things too much. We can put too much weight on them or too much importance on them. And in so doing, we can set ourselves up for a lot of damage. So easy examples of this would be to think about food or alcohol, right? Like food and alcohol are not bad things in and of themselves, but unrestrained desire for what you want to consume could do some real damage to your body and more. Likewise, sex is a really good thing, but to give in to every sexual desire that you have at some point is gonna cause damage to yourself 
and to your relationships. And I could go on. There are a lot of examples like this, but I think in general, you get the idea. The, the point is, is that it's not a bad thing to not always get what you want. Now, here's why I bring all that up. I would argue that while we have something of a framework by which to understand this when it comes to wanting things in excess, like food or drink or sex in some cases, when it comes down to the day-to-day -day beliefs about our personal happiness, we actually cannot fathom how something like this could be true. When it comes to things like our marriage, we just so naturally default into, like if my marriage doesn't become all that I envisioned it would be, how could I possibly expect to be happy? If my sex life isn't portray, isn't like it's portrayed in the movies, how could I possibly be fulfilled? If my career doesn't go where I wanted it to go, where I dreamed it would go, or if I don't make what I thought I would make and have the lifestyle that I craved, how can my life be anything other than a disappointment? If I don't have the house or the kids or the car or whatever it is that I want, how could I possibly be satisfied? And I would argue that this is the air we breathe. This is how we think and feel almost by default. This idea that if my life is not exactly as I want it to be, something must be wrong with it. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Maybe God is doing something wrong, but it's wrong. But if I just had something different, if I just had something more, if I just had something new, or more specifically, if I just had what I see they have, then, then I think I would be okay. Then I think I would actually find what I'm looking for. And this is the fundamental issue that the tenth field or his male servant or his female servant, his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, lasting or family notwithstanding, I don't know how many of us out here are actually desiring our neighbor's cows or donkeys, okay? <laughs> I saw you guys here and I had to take the opportunity. I was like, this is my moment. I got to do it. Uh, no, I love you guys. I'm, I'm just playing. Uh, but, but genuinely, like we, we can read this verse and we can think, all right, well, that doesn't quite connect. Like I don't find myself in that space. And so it might be helpful for us to actually put a little bit of modern vocabulary on this. Like if God were to write the Ten Commandments today, commandment number 10 might go something more like this. You shall not covet what you see on TV or what your friend posts on social media. You shall not desire their season of life or their relationship status or how well their kids seem to be doing or their new house or their latest iPhone or that new job in that new city. Like despite the cultural distance between the world of this verse and our own, these are the things it is actually talking about. These are the things it's actually addressing. So when it brings up your neighbor's wife, like what are we talking about here? It's a relationship status that is different than the one that you have. A different person, whether real or imaginary, that is not your spouse. Your neighbor's house or their land, literally where they live. Be it the house that looks like it came straight out of Magnolia Farms or simply the location of it. Oh, they live in that neighborhood. I bet life is so good over there. I bet they don't have to put up with all this HOA crap that we have to put up with. I bet this would be the good life if we were able to be in that neighborhood or that city that seems so much more exciting than my own. His male or his female servants. Ser servants is a sign of wealth. So we're talking about zeros in the bank account here. The lifestyle they are able to lead, their status, their job, the type of people they get to hang around or the events that they are invited to their ox or donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor is just simply a catch-all for their stuff, for the things that they own, their boat, that car, that phone, fill in the blank, however you like. The point is, is that this command is intentionally covering a lot of ground because it's not really about what your neighbor has per se, but about your discontentment with what's been given to you. It's not actually about what your neighbor has. It's about the discontentment you have with what's been given to you. That desire within us that says, if only this were different. If only this were different about my life. If only this 
were a little bit more like theirs, then I would be happier. Things would be better. I would be okay. If only I had a little bit more money like they do. If only my life weren't so busy like theirs seems to be. If only I were married or if only I weren't married or if only my spouse were different. If only my kids were a little bit older or if only I made that other decision when I graduated and it went into a career like what they went into. If only the kids would come around more often like their kids seem to do, or if only my kids wouldn't be around so much, if they could just manage a little bit on their own, I would be okay. If only my college friends were still around, or if only my life group was a little bit different, if only I had a different job, or if only I lived in a different city, if only, if only, if only, if only. What this command is dealing with, it's dealing with this impulse within each and every one of us to believe that the life God has given me, whether in part or in whole, is simply not enough. It's dealing with this impulse within us that believes the life that God has given me is just not enough. Or to say it even more straightforward, coveting is the byproduct of believing that the grass is greener somewhere else. It's the byproduct of believing that the grass is greener somewhere else. So my life group was hanging out a few weeks ago, uh, and somehow or another, we got onto the topic of how adult life is just different than what we thought it was gonna be when we were coming up. Like when you're growing up, basically it's big exciting thing to big exciting thing to big exciting thing to big exciting thing. It's going to elementary school and then graduating elementary school and going to middle school and then it's going to high school and then it's getting your license and then it's graduating high school and going off to college and then graduating college and starting that career of your dreams or what you hope will be your dreams. And all of that gets kind of jammed into 21 or maybe 22 23 if you like victory lap years of life, right? And then after that, it all of a sudden just slows way, way down. And maybe there's marriage and maybe there's some kids, but it's mostly bills, right? It's mostly bills and going to work every day and doing a lot of the same things over and over and over again. That career that we thought was gonna be so exciting, yeah, it's got some cool moments, but it's also kind of boring most of the time. It's kind of the same thing day after day. That marriage that was gonna be our happily ever after, yeah, it's happy, but there's also a lot more robust exchanges of ideas than we thought was going to be there. That picturesque family, with the three kids who were all straight-A students and super good at sports, who all ate around the dinner table every night to a home-cooked meal. Man, it's got a lot more C's and shoving fast food in our mouths on our way to watch one of them kick the ball into their own goal than we expected it would be. And we were just sitting around and we were talking about how unexpected all of that was. And maybe some wise soul somewhere tried to tell us and we were just too young and too dumb to listen, but it took us by surprise. And almost every one of us remarked somewhere in the midst of it that there's this tendency to start thinking, man, what what if I had just done things differently? What if I had just made some different decisions with my life? What if I didn't make the choices I made, but what if I had made the choices that this other person had made? What if I'd gone to the school that they went to? What if I'd picked a different career path? Maybe one like so-and-so picked. What if I had married the type of person that they married? And in my experience, this is something that the vast majority of us wind up going through. We get to a place where we realize that we are no longer building our lives, but our lives have been built. And we're left to wrestle with whether or not we actually like what's been constructed. And in that space, it is so easy to look at the lives of others and think, maybe it's better over there. Maybe it's better over there. Maybe it's happier. Maybe there's less stress. 
Maybe what they have or what they're doing is what I really need. Maybe, just maybe, the grass is actually greener someplace else. And when left unchecked, this can produce all manner of coveting within us. And we can get fixated or obsessed on getting what we don't have, on making our lives look more like that person's real or imaginary that we compare our own to. And honestly, it can flesh out in a thousand different ways for you. Like, I don't exactly know how it might look for you. Like, maybe for you, it's incessant scrolling on Zillow, wishing you just had a house that was different than your own. Or maybe it's spending every last available dollar on upfitting and remodeling to make your home the envy of your neighborhood. Maybe you can't stand your income level, even though your basic needs are more than met, and you get so bothered when you see other people being able to do the things that you only wish you could do. Maybe it's obsessing about your relationship or lack thereof, spending every waking thought of yours is on how single you are and how much life would be better if you had a spouse, specifically a spouse like so-and-so. Or maybe you're married and you think the exact same thing, that if your spouse was just different. That would be the ticket. And so you're on a one man or one woman campaign to change them, constantly nitpicking and complaining about them because they aren't like so-and-so, even if so-and-so is just a made up person in your brain. And I don't know how it flushes out for you, but that dissatisfaction, that belief that the grass is greener somewhere else is at the very heart of coveting. It is at the very heart of what God is commanding against here. And for what it's worth, I honestly know, and I know, I know I've only lived in this society, so my frame of reference is very small, but I know of no other society in human history that feels more fundamentally set against this command than our own. This is just the water we swim in. It's almost like this is how we are taught or groomed to think about life. I mean, think about modern advertising. In nearly every ad you see, there is laden within it some sort of promise that uh, appeals to our covetous desire. Maybe it's an attractive person on the billboard or a group of people at a restaurant or a city having the time of our lives, or maybe it's just a catchy slogan that promises that their product uh, promises something that their product is selling. Like in nearly every one of those, there's this appeal towards this sense of discontent that lives inside of you. It subtly and sometimes not so subtly says to you, maybe your life is fine, but if you had this or if you were here, it would definitely be better. It would definitely be better. Our browsers and our apps are selling our data and history to major corporations so they can tailor advertisements exclusively to this tracking our phones, what stores we go to, and our combos to give us advertisements specifically tailored to all of these unmet desires that exist within us. Because it's far easier to make money off of unhappy people than it is to make money off of those who are content. And every advertiser worth their salt knows this. But to be fair, it's easy to pick on advertisements, but it's not just our marketing. You heard it in the video earlier. Like, Just think for a moment about social media. What you see generally is a filtered photo of someone whose life just seems so put together. Like they're just knocking it out of the park. Like they just know what they're doing. You see the mom and dad smiling with their kids and we see that photo and it just does something to us, right? Like it triggers something within us. It's almost like we go like, man, look, you see how nice that is? Don't you want that? Don't you wish that were you? And it doesn't matter that we don't see the five dozen attempts and all the bribing it took of the children to get that photo, but it appeals to something that we long for for ourselves. Or the post of the single 20 or 30 something living it up in an exotic location, having the time of their lives. And maybe they're an influencer or maybe they just wanna remember the moment, but either way, it appeals to these emotions and feelings within us. It makes us want what they have and produces all kinds of coveting in our hearts. And in the process, we become enslaved to it. Like we really do buy the lie that that's where happiness is gonna be found. We, we buy it hook, line, and sinker that yes, if I did have a life like that, then I really would be okay. 
And listen, I'm not trying to demonize these things. I'm really not. I'm not trying to tell you you need to be done with the internet. Though, if I can be honest, some of you maybe should, right? Like maybe, maybe a lot of us should, but that's not, not my aim. I'm just trying to help us see that the deck of comparison is stacked against us. It is everywhere we go. It is everything we see. And if the truth were to be told, all these things do is lead us fur- into, further of, into more of a place of disenchantment and discontent. Because even when we get the thing that we are told we need, we quickly find that it's not enough, that it doesn't actually do for us what we thought it was going to do, and we need something else to do the trick. And it becomes this endless cycle where we can't stop coveting because we think it's the next thing. It's the next thing. It's just out of my reach. And so you see here, The call of the 10th command, it's actually a pretty radical call, especially for us in our cultural moment. This is a pretty radical thing. The call of the 10th commandment is radical acceptance of the life God has given you. What the 10th command is calling us to here is radical acceptance of the lot that we have been given to become a person who doesn't look out and say, the key to my joy is having what I don't, but rather a person who says, you know what? I am good with what God has given me for however much or however little it may seem. I love the way that the psalmist puts it in Psalm 16. This is verses five and six. He says, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. It's a wonderful picture of radical acceptance. Radical acceptance that says, I know that God holds my life. I know that he is the one who holds my life. So I know that the lines of my life, whatever they may be, have fallen for me in pleasant places. I know that the lines of my life, whatever they are, are for my good. It's a radical acceptance acceptance that says, this is my job, right? This is my job, and it may not be the job that I signed up for, but it is the job that God has given to me. And it might not always be my job, but it is my job today. And so I'm gonna do everything I can to bring him as much glory as I can in the way that I work. Or it's a a radical acceptance that says, this is my spouse, or this is my family, or this is my singleness. This is the gift that God has given me. And it might not be the gift that I asked for, but it is a gift. And God and God only gives good gifts. So I can know, despite how hard it may or may not be, this gift is for my good. And even if it is hard sometimes, I know that through the power of the Spirit, I'm gonna do everything I can to embrace it to love and bless and give my life away for the good of others and God's glory because I know he's got me, because I know the lines he's laid for me fall in pleasant places. It's a radical acceptance that says, this is my church and these are my people. And yeah, they're a little rough around the edges like me, but this is where God has me. That yeah, there may be some people in my community that I wouldn't have invited, but I didn't send out the invitations. Jesus did. So I'm going to hustle and I'm going to serve and I'm going to do whatever I can to make my church the healthiest it can possibly be with my God-given strengths and gifts because these are the lines he has laid for me. And acceptance, it says, this is my life and it's the only one I got and it's the one God has given me and it's enough because he is enough. Honestly, it reminds me of one of my absolute favorite passages of scripture. One that for me, like when this temptation to believe that the grass is greener elsewhere, like really does serve as an anchor for my soul. It's Psalm 23. And it's, it's a rather famous one to be quite honest with you. Maybe you've heard it or seen it on a co- coffee mug, but I just wanna read it to you. And I wanna see if you can grasp the beauty behind what David is saying here. This is what he writes. This is Psalm 23, starting in verse one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He is the one who fills my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, so my cup overflows. 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love this text so much because here the scriptures are telling us that this is who God actually is. This is who he is. He is our shepherd. He is the shepherd who cares for his sheep. As a shepherd makes sure that his sheep have exactly what they need for their good, that they are fed, that they are protected, that they are in spots where they are able to thrive. So does God do for his people in any and every circumstance. The psalmist David, which, which if you know anything about his life, you know it was a roller coaster. Yes, he became king, but drama and trouble always seemed to crouch at his door, including people literally trying to hunt him down and kill him. And yet he is able to look out on all of that in his life and say, God, you are my shepherd, so I know I'm okay. You are my shepherd, so I know I won't lack. I won't lack. You are my shepherd, so I know that my cup, even here, even in this, it is actually overflowing. I mean, what an incredible thing to say. And I love it. I love it so much. He's able to look out on his life and say, God, you've got me. And because you've got me and subsequently I've got you, I've got everything I need. I can see the value in whatever li wherever life has brought me. My circumstances are good for me. They are pleasant for me. They are beautiful for me. I love the lines that you have set for me because I know that this is who you are. I know that this is who you are. The point being that the grass isn't greener somewhere else. The grass is green where God waters it and the grass is watered wherever he is found. The grass is green wherever God is at. And the good news of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is that God has made, through it, God has made a way for him to be found with you, wherever you are, whatever your circumstance may be, whatever cards life has or has not dealt with you. Through the work of Jesus Christ, he is with you always, as he promises, forevermore. By canceling the record of our sin, he opened wide the gates for you to be found in the sheepfold of God, where he is your shepherd and you shall not lack for anything, where he gives you his Holy Spirit, his very presence and his power to live in you at all times and in all places that will lead you by still waters and will make your bed in green pastures, even and perhaps especially when your life feels like the very valley of the shadow of death, where you feel surrounded by the presence of your enemies, his promise is that he has a table set for you there, that he has something for your good and his glory, even in the midst of that. And because Jesus is alive, the, this promise is secure that no matter what happens, no matter what your circumstances may be, whatever circumstances you find yourself in, no matter what you have or what you gain or what you lose or what gets taken from you in this life, goodness and mercy will always follow you. And when this life, when these 80 years, this drop in the bucket is over and done, you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, forever. And honestly, this is why all of this matters. This is why coveting is such a big deal to God and why he includes it in his list of 10 commands because coveting at its heart is an act of faith. Maybe you've never thought about it like that, but coveting is always an act of faith. When I set my hopes or my wants or my expectations onto something, whether that be a relationship or a job or a career or a thing, just fill in the blank. I am implicitly making a faith statement that says, I trust this to make me whole. I trust this to do for me what I feel like I ultimately need, to give my soul rest. This is why the New Testament authors draw a direct line between coveting and idolatry, because it is to essentially look at something else to do for you what only God can actually do to make you whole, to satisfy the deepest places of your soul and give you lasting joy. And anything you place your faith in, that you set your desire on outside of what you were made for, which is God and God alone, it will ultimately leave you devastated because it can never be enough. It can never actually do for you what you want it to. You will never be fully content. 
You will always be left feeling dissatisfied in the long run until you find yourself enslaved by these desires. Because as, as that Augustine quote that I share often says, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. He is what you were made for, and he is the only place that your soul is finally going to find contentment. And God knows that there is only one thing worthy of our faith, only one thing that can truly carry the weight of our existence and our joy, and that is himself. Like David goes on to say a few verses later in Psalm 16, this is verse 11. He says, you make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. If you are looking for joy, if you are looking for happiness, if you are looking for purpose and wholeness and fulfillment and satisfaction, you don't have to look any further than God himself. You just don't. He is where joy and life will be found forevermore. In other places, he is called the bread of life and the fountain of living waters, imagery that tells us that every longing of the human soul, every desire, every hunger, every thirst will be filled in him. And the reason God says, don't look at what other people have and wish you had it for your own is because that would mean you are failing to see what you already got in him. You're failing to see it. And this is what God wants for each and every one of us to know that he is more than enough and he is available to be had by you. And to that, you may be thinking, man, you know, that sound, that seems real easy for you to say, Bailey. Like, you don't know my lot. You don't know what cards I've been dealt. You don't know how miserable I am. You don't know how poorly things have gone for me. You don't know how much better it feels like it would be if my life were actually more like someone else's. And that, that is true. I don't. But allow me, if you will, just to speak to that for just a moment. Let me first just say this, that this command to not covet is not a command to not grieve. And that is an important distinction. Sometimes life just does not go how we planned. Uh, excuse me. Sometimes life doesn't just go not how we planned. It actually goes bad. Sometimes our good desires, even godly desires, aren't met. Sometimes the lines of our life aren't just undesirable, but they are actually hard. We live in a world still marred by the effects of sin. We experience a loss, perhaps an untimely one, that with everything in us we wish never happened. In that instance, we wish our situation could have, been, could have turned out like everyone else's seemed to. We desire marriage, but it doesn't find us, or our spouse changes over time in ways that we did not expect them to. And hear me, it is not wrong to grieve or to put a biblical word on it, to lament those things, to cry out to God and to wish that they were different. In fact, I would argue that bringing our grief and lament to God is essential for finding ultimate joy and radical acceptance of the life he has given. No, this command is not a command against lament. This command is a command against seeking the wrong healing to that pain. That's what this is actually about. This is a command to believe, to hope, to trust the one who cares for us. Maybe your marriage is truly struggling right now. The 10th commandment is trying to help you see that the answer isn't just in wishing for something different. Rather, the 10th commandment beckons you to come to and believe in the one who reconciles all things, the one who puts things back together. It's who he is. It's what he's done to pray for his healing, to pray for his restoration, to trust that he will deliver, to trust that even when you can't see it, he has something for you here, that he has something for you here. And it's even for your good, despite how difficult it may feel. Maybe for one reason or another, you're not able to have the family you dreamed of. The 10th commandment is trying to help you see that comfort isn't going to come from envying those who have what you don't. But comfort will come from the one who has brought you into his family for eternity. And to trust that even if your story doesn't turn out like you hoped it would, he is with you and he has something for you there that he has not and he will not abandon you, but has made a table for you 
in the most unlikely of places. You see, the gospel shows us that this is God's MO. This is his mode of operation, his modus operandi, to bring glory out of the absolute worst that life can throw. This is what the cross of Christ tells us. The cross was the worst of circumstances. The fullness of sin and evil was laid on to Jesus. He was murdered by the very hands he came to save. And if there were ever a situation in life where one would desperately and obsessively wish it would turn out different, it would have been that one. But Jesus took it willingly. And if he can take murder and turn it into salvation, he can handle what is ever happening in your life right now. It's who he is. It's what he does. And you can have the confidence to know that even if you can't see it, even if you never see it, there's glory and good that he can do through it. And if he didn't abandon you in the worst of circumstances, he will not abandon you now. It is one of my favorite things to say, and I hope at some point you hear it and it gets all the way down into your soul because he will not abandon you. The cross is the proof. He is with you even to the end of age. We can have no fear because in light of the cross, we know that God is going to take care of us no matter what the hardship is and will rather use it to bring it, bring it, do something for our good and his glory. And listen, I don't know, I don't know your situation. I don't, I don't know how things have or haven't turned out as you wish they would have. I don't know how bad things have actually gotten. But what I do know is that because the tomb is empty, no matter how bad it is, God is not done. You hear me? Because the tomb is empty, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are right now. God is not done. And what the 10th commandment wants to draw you into today is faith in that God. Faith that the God who empties tombs is the same God who cares for you today, right now, in whatever you're going through, whatever your unmet desires may be this morning, he cares. And so maybe you find yourself in the midst of discontent this morning, wishing that you had the money that someone else has, the family, the house, the stuff, the opportunity, or just simply the life that is other than your own. The good news of this points us to the, to the reality that you don't have to live your life consumed, obsessed, and fixated on what you don't have that others do. If onlys do not have to run the show for you, you can radically accept the life that you've built, however it's been constructed, because Jesus is the shepherd of your soul. Because Jesus is the shepherd of your soul. And we can say with David again in Psalm 16 that the Lord is our chosen portion and our cup that he holds our lot and the lines have fallen for us in pleasant places. Indeed, we have a beautiful inheritance because this is who he is. And this is what he's promised to do. He's going to give you exactly what you need when you need it. And it might not be what someone else has, but because you've got him, you can radically in faith accept it and find joy because the grass is greenest whenever we're with him. And he has promised to always be with us. So may we learn to love the lines that God has set for us. Whatever they are, however difficult or not they may be, because we can know they are for our good. And this is why I said at the beginning that I thought the 10th command further presses us back into all that this series has been about. Because the 10 commandments, God's law, these are the lines that God has laid for us. These are the lines that God has drawn for all of us to guard us, to protect us, to allow our lives to flourish in the pasture of his promise. And so may we learn to love them too. 
May we learn to love the lines that God has set for us because he is good and they are good for our good always.